So my name is Lauren and I am the Public Program Specialist at the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's talk on War Remembrance and Comics. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to make a traditional land acknowledgement. Since this program is being held virtually, a singular land acknowledgement does not capture all of our locations. I will share the Peel Region Acknowledgement and invite everyone to consider their own position with regards to the land on which they find themselves. The land on which we gather and which the Region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land and continue to do so today. In particular, the territory of the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples, the land that is home to the Métis, and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land, and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Matthew Wilkinson and Daniel Wong, who are joining us for today's talk. Matthew is a seventh generation born and raised Mississauga resident and has been, with, been the historian with Heritage Mississauga since 2004 and a member of staff since 2001. He has been working with Daniel for many years to produce a heritage themed comic book that celebrates the stories of Mississauga. I will now pass it over to Matthew to get our conversation started. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, for, uh, for inviting us and thank you to Pamela for hosting this. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to kind of uh, explore the stories and uh, uh, you know, ultimately how they end up in, in uh, the, the, the format of a comic book and how that uh, uh, aids in our, our connecting uh, the stories of our past to our residents. It's an absolutely fascinating thing that came to be and we'll explore that a little bit later on in the program, but I will say when we take uh, kind of the, the, the research that uh, you know, I'm most comfortable in and my colleagues and archives are, are very familiar with and then translating that into a, a, a graphic depiction such as appears in a comic book it was not an easy mental exercise to grasp for someone in my position and uh, we'll explore that a, a little bit on a little bit later on but um, has become uh, the comic book uh, program uh, for lack of a better word has become one of our, our uh, celebrated programs at Heritage Mississauga and one of our best connected programs in terms of community involvement and community engagement. Uh, just recently uh, 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 we're engaged with the uh, Hazel McCallion 100 Years of Memories exhibit at the Air Mills Town Centre and as part of that uh, the comic books are available, all nine issues of them and they are going like hotcakes at that place. I'm, I'm there at least once a week restocking shelves so uh, it, it goes to tell you that there's a there's an appetite for uh, engaging in history in this way. So our, our program today is uh, it's kind of a, a two or three part program and we're going to focus first on on the, the, the remembrance and connecting to our fallen soldiers uh, through the Mississauga Remembers Research Project. Uh, uh, a few years ago, Heritage Mississauga undertook uh, a concept of developing a virtual war memorial. Uh, for many of, 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 of you who know Mississauga, you'll know that the city is not a village that became a town that became a city, but rather Mississauga is born through amalgamation. Uh, it's born through a bunch of places that were lumped together in a series of, of, uh, of amalgamations to create what is now the city of Mississauga. And as such, even though uh, generations upon generations of people who lived on the land that is now the city of Mississauga, um, they didn't, most of them did not know Mississauga by name. Uh, they knew places like Clarkson and Port Credit and Lorne Park and, and Malton and Meadowvale and Streetsville and so on. Um, and so when we're looking at the lives of the, of the soldiers and those who, fell, who ser served and fell from our community, we're connecting back to those places that were really kind of the ancestors of the city of Mississauga. And one of the ways, so we're going to break it down into a few steps here in terms of, uh, or a few parts in terms of, uh, of, uh, of how we come apart with the information we have. And the first steps are, are really what the landscape remembers. Uh, there's, a, there's an old adage that people do not write down or record things that they, they, they wish to forget. Um, and so at some point in time, decisions were made to create memorials to service and sacrifice. Uh, and those memorials were inscribed with names. And so they, they, those cenotaphs, if you will, or, or you know, the Port Credit's official name, Port Credit and Vicinity Soldiers Memorial, uh, or the Streetsville Great Overseas Veterans Memorial, we know them today as the Port Credit Memorial, uh, Port Credit War Memorial and the Streetsville Cenotaph, but they were created just in the, in the aftermath of the First World War. 
uh, and uh, they're they're quite different, quite striking in their in their uh, in in their designs, um, and uh, they become they have become the 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 focal point of remembrance ceremonies within the city of Mississauga today. Uh, and they're inscribed with names, and so they give us starting points in terms of trying to understand uh, that uh, the, that that uh, those people, those, that that moment of sacrifice in in a community. Uh, but there are other places within our community. We have other cenotaphs. Again, all of them or most of them predate the city of Mississauga. And uh, in addition to to other cenotaphs around our our, our city, we also have uh, historic community memorials, whether they be in legions or in uh, um, uh, congregate settings such as churches or uh, or um, uh, Masonic lodges and uh, even in some cases cemeteries will have a, a commemoration a local commemoration to to war dead within that community within that cemetery so there's all kinds of places that are that we find names for those who served and those who fell uh, and they become the starting points for for research into who were these people? What can we find out about them? Uh, what are their stories? And and perhaps uh, I don't I don't know if it ever it really started out this way, but there is a major desire as we went along to find pictures. Uh, can we find out who these sons and daughters of this place were and what they looked like? Uh, why have we somewhat, in some cases, forgotten who they were? Yet their names are etched uh, uh, on on monuments within our community. And what can we do to to uncover those stories, and to bring them to light and share them once again? Um, Informational repositories, uh, fancy word for archives and collections of information. Uh, I mean, there are some uh, incredible uh, resources, both online and within our community, to to consult for for information. And we can go on for hours on this slide, and we'll, we'll we'll gloss over a little bit in the format of this presentation. But you know, things like like newspapers, whether they be uh, my, whether they're microfilm newspapers uh, at, at PAMA or actual newspapers like the Streetsville Review through Streetsville Historical Society, or on online uh, digitized newspapers, the, the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star and the like, they're great places to start. We already have names thanks to the Cenotaphs, but they don't encompass, not, not every soldier who fell in the First and Second World Wars are remembered on Cenotaphs. Uh, locally, so we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Uh, the Region Appeal Archives at PAMA have some great local history collections, the Perkins Bowl collections, uh, the Peel War Board uh, uh, information cards, uh, local newspapers, so much more. But a really good starting point when you have the name of a soldier is to try to track them down through through uh, references to attestation papers. Uh, Library and Archives Canada has a, a military section for First and Second World War, but also for other conflicts such as the South African War or the Fenian raids and so on. And so you can really start tracking down some uh, so, some personal information in terms of ser uh, service records when they're digitalized, attestation papers and the like. Um, but other things, uh, other entities like Ancestry.ca, uh, Geo Beach Centre, there are just so many ways in which to, uh, to find information. Our uh, research project has focused uh, largely on the fallen soldiers from our community, those names that are on cenotaphs um, and, and other memorials in our, in our city. Uh, something like the Commonwealth War Graves Commission becomes an invaluable resource in terms of trying to confirm uh, service numbers and burial locations, uh, uh, death records, etc. Uh, of trying to to identify and connect with these people from our community to, to kind of put to put together the, the framework of a story of their life and times. Um, so, it, you know, we're starting with names and starting to gather information. You're starting to put together attestation papers and, and next of kin lists and things like that. But what can we find out about them and how do we go about doing that? To put them in the context, and we're dealing in this presentation today with First and Second World War. Um, so from the First World War, we know that there's over 619,000 Canadians enlisted, uh, 60,661 Canadian casualties. It's estimated because there's no hard number of, 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 uh, of, of known enlistments because people didn't always enlist for, uh, at the place in which they lived. But it's estimated about 1,600 men from Peel County enlisted, including about 700 from historic Mississauga. 
of those 700, 96 are confirmed fallen. And so it's an approximately number of one in eight soldiers from historic Mississauga did not return home. That's actually higher than the national average, which is roughly one in 10. Uh, and the vast majority of our fallen in terms of just percentages come from southern Mississauga, which makes sense because it's the most populated area at the time, but largely from the Port Credit, Kirks and Lorne Park and Lakeview areas of Mississauga has a high number of casualties. That's why also when you go to see a cenotaph, for example, there are more names on the Port Credit uh, War Memorial than there are on the streets for War Memorial. Simply more people uh, fell from that, uh, well, for lack of a better word, from that catchment area, if you will. From the First World War, Mississauga connections, again, 96 known fallen. 78 names are listed on Mississauga Bay cenotaphs and memorials. That means not everyone from this community who fell uh, had a name recorded. And we do not know why. That, that's, uh, that's a vagueness that is, is lost to those who brought those names forward. It is possible that when the cenotaphs were created in the years following the, uh, the First World War, that maybe those families had moved on and there was no one left to kind of bring that name forward. There are also names on our cenotaphs of families that uh, moved to historic Mississauga after the war and brought their, their, their loved ones' names with them, but they themselves were not from this community during the war. Um, we even have a, 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 a British soldier listed on the Rule of Honor at St. Peter's Anglican Church who was never in Canada, was not a Canadian soldier, and was killed in December of 1914 before any Canadians were on the front, yet he finds his name on a roll of honor at St. Peter's Anglican Church Arendelle in Mississauga, and that's simply because that roll of honor was created in 1928, and his parents moved to historic Mississauga in 1926, and, and when that uh, uh, roll of honor was created, they added their son's name to it. That stumped us for a long time on why on earth this name is, is on this, uh, on this uh, memorial, if you will. Uh, but there is Franklin Sturch uh, himself, never in Canada, uh, did not serve as a Canadian, and yet his name is remembered on an honor roll in a, in, in a, in a foreign country to, to where he had, uh, he had lived and died. Um, again, the average age of our fallen in the First World War is 24 years of age. Um, they do represent really a youth of the community. Of the 96 known fallen, uh, uh, 76 of them are unmarried and single. There's 76 young men who did not leave family behind them, uh, did not leave you know, a spouse behind them. Um, and, and so you know, it begins to tell a story that kind of tugs on the heartstrings a little bit. Uh, we've, uh, some pictures start to tell it all. Uh, this is uh, labeled the Port Credit, Port Credit Boys, Salisbury Plain, 1915. The first of our fallen in uh, the second from the upper right corner. If I, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but you can circle him there. That's Private John Leviston of Port Credit. He fell in March of 1915. He's the first of our casualties. Uh, uh, and uh, but stories like this begin to put names and faces. And these are these are local boys. These are, are Port Credit. Same one uh, labeled Port Credit Boys at Arras. That's the the Vimy Offensive in May of 1917. Uh, you know these boys now have seen action. These are these are local boys. Uh, shirts rolled up. Uh, the prim and proper poses are gone. These are these are veterans and veterans all. They've seen battle. They've seen casualties uh, and the like. And the, and the poses reflect uh, reflect that. Um, we have uh, soldiers at the Clarkson train station, in spring of 1915, that are that are, uh, are gathered and they're having a a brief uh, a brief lunch uh, after their train broke down, and uh, the uh, uh, they were treated to a lunch and stra uh, strawberry tarts and tea by the Clarkson Women's Association. Uh, soldiers, uh, you know, this is Dundas Street at Mississauga Road. Uh, in the distance, you can just see the spire of St. Peter's Anglican Church rising up the, out of the treetops. Um, that is Mississauga Road just down in the distance there. This is Dundas Street through Arendelle. And, you know, try picturing a, a troop of soldiers marching along Dundas Street. is something we're not uh, used to seeing. But this is known as Colonel Kennedy's men, and they're on their way to Hamilton for, for training. Um, and there we have Streetsville, uh, the, uh, the, the picture is labeled the 74th, we rather think it might be the 75th, which is raised locally, um, but here we have some soldiers that uh, are standing in a ditch in Streetsville and uh, look like they are uh, having some, uh, something to eat or drink at the, at the, at the time. 
um, you know, these are these are from our community, and the Second World War is 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 no different in terms of the story. Although the breadth of the conflict and the and the number of Canadians who served are much larger than the First World War. Um, 1.1 million Canadians served in uniform during the war, broken up into Army, RCAF, Navy, and the Medical Corps. Uh, we have 42,042 killed. Um, estimated that just under 3,000 from Peel County were enlisted, and of them, we know we have 89 known fallen from historic Mississauga. So we have 96 fallen from the First World War from Mississauga, 89 in the Second World War. Of the 89 uh, known fallen, 79 names are listed on the Saga Bay Cenotaphs and Honor Rolls, with the average age just a slight bit younger than the First World War, 23 years of age. Uh, we are in our infancy and in kind of uh, in terms of uh, going through the material that we've assembled on this. We have thousands of files now on Second World War soldiers, but we're kind of creating those stat sheets that we've uh, we've long since had for the uh, First World War. So our kind of uh, dissemination and uh, deciphering of the records of, the, of Second World War is ongoing, as is our search for, for information and images for, uh, pertaining to, uh, to individual servicemen. Um, the home front is not to be neglected, and this plays into the development of some of our comic stories as well is you know what happened here at home during the conflicts and both during the first world war and the second we had a number of wartime industries that were active in historic mississauga uh we uh, mississauga was home to the long branch aerodrome down in the lakeview area in the first world war it's the first of its kind for a military air training school in canada it was established in uh, in mississauga again known as the long branch aerodrome uh, we also had, uh, it was home to the Curtis Aviation School, which was a flight training school out of the Long Branch Aerodrome. Um, pilots at first paid their own expenses, and uh, the 261 graduates in two years from the program, just over 120 of them served with either the Royal Naval Air Service or the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, they didn't serve as Canadian pilots during the First World War. Um, and then as the First World War progressed, the uh, aviation school closed and it was taken over by the Royal Flying Corps Cadet Wing Training Program, which was training pilots at this location for ground training and other classroom activities uh, at the time for the duration of the First World War. There's a, a great picture of the Long Branch Camp. Uh, again, the, this is in Mississauga today on the south side of Lakeshore Road at the foot of Dixie Road, uh, something that is, is kind of largely forgotten on our landscape today, but very much a, a physical presence on the landscape historically, and the pictures do uh, begin to tell some of that story. Uh, also, during the Second World War, we are home to Demean Small Arms Limited, one of the largest uh, small armaments manufacturers during the uh, during the Second World War that was located in Canada, um, and uh, a, a massive workforce by the end of the war. Women from all over Canada were employed in very large numbers, um, and uh, at the height of their production by 1943, over 5,500 employees and 30,000 units each month, including the the, uh, the weapons themselves and the ammunition that would be required uh, for the uh, for their operation. Also, uh, Mississauga was home to uh, Victory Aircraft during the Second World War, and uh, uh, Lancaster bombers, 422 of them, were built in Malton. What a fantastic picture of the rollout of the 100th Lancaster there with the employee workforce standing in front and across the wings there. And this was at uh, at the Malton facility, which would later become home to AV Row Canada and, of course, the famed Averero. But Victory Aircraft was born as a government uh, subsidy to oversee the contract to build uh, the Lancaster heavy bomber during uh, the Second World War. Um, and that's, of course, the subject of our, our, our latest comic, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, also, uh, Canadians, and particularly some Mississauga uh, uh, individuals, were connected to Ferry Command, which was the entity that was established to transit uh, completed aircraft overseas to the front line. So it was a way of taking uh, aircraft from uh, that were made here in Canada and transporting them across the Atlantic to the theaters of war. Uh, we're also home in Malton to the Commonwealth Air Training Plan, uh, which functioned between 1939 and 1945. It was a multinational uh, air crew, the largest of its kind ever created in terms of training pilots for overseas uh, 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 service. And Malton was home to the number one elementary fly, uh, flying training school between 1939 and 1945. And that was incidentally just to the south of the Victory Aircraft Facility that was building the Lancaster Bombers. 
Um, and so, you know, we start to give that framework of life and times, if you will, of understanding kind of how a historic Mississauga fits into that. And then, you know, how can we start to put together the story, not only of individuals, but also of the larger community fabric of, of understanding those life and times. But it really does come back to the individual stories of our fallen soldiers um, and the names as we assemble them. Again, mo many of these, we start with the names that are on the cenotaphs, but we augment them over time with other notices of, of fallen for, for individuals for one reason or another whose names do not appear on some tasks and we end up with a, with a, a fairly lengthy list uh, sadly enough. Uh, I do remember working with a very passionate student uh, when we were beginning our first World War research back in the early um, 2011 or 12, um, and uh, the uh, she, she would get so attached to the individuals themselves. She, she, scream out in the office, I found one, and then almost immediately be like, damn it, because she was so upset that we're dealing with, you know, another end of life. And it's hard not to get involved with the individuals as you begin to explore their stories and find out, you know, where they lived, who their loved ones were, or letters home uh, when, when they when they survive, but just the story of their sacrifice and, and where they're remembered and, and, you know, like things like burial cards and uh, uh, communications back to the family to, to mourn their losses. And, and every one of these, that their name on a list, and sometimes you, you lose sight that every one of these names was a life and the life cut short. Uh, every one of these represents, you know, we've heard the terms, the finest of us all, those that volunteered to serve when their nation called and ultimately did not return home. And every one of them has stories. And in some cases, we've been able to find those stories and uh, and decipher some of them. In some cases, there's still mystery attached to them. Uh, one, for an example, uh, uh, in 1916, uh, the, the death of Private Frederick Graham who actually served under an alias, and his real name was Joseph Garbett, um, but we have no idea why he served under an alias. There didn't seem to be any, there's, there doesn't seem to be a logical reason that we've, we've uncovered that why he served under a name that was not his own. Um, after his death, it was, it was actually uncovered that he had uh, served under an alias, and both his names appear on his gravestone. Uh, so you'll find on, on the gravestone, um, uh, in France, uh, you'll find both Frederick Graham and Joseph Garbett on the same gravestone. It's the same individual. Um, you know, the stories that, that we do not know, uh, you know, much about, but then other ones that really start to, to uh, uh, share some stories. Uh, Thomas Cartwright from Arendelle was apparently a heck of an athlete. He was one of the few that was married and left children behind and the newspaper recounted his sporting glories. One, one very good baseball player apparently. Um, and uh, another one like George Osborne Hall, who's, uh, whose father just helped establish the, the Mississauga Gulf and Country Club. Um, and uh, the community mourned, uh, mourned his loss as the, the son of a, a respected community member. Lieutenant Angus Gray from the St. Lawrence Starch Factory and uh, of the Gray family. And, and the stories go on and on there they really do every community has them and and every one of these lives is is a is a, is a really uh, kind of tragic story to encapsulate the pictures i think really start to hammer at home uh of the 96 fallen uh during the first world war we've uh, we've uncovered i believe it's 46 uh, portraits of individuals and here's just a sampling of them I mean, these are young individuals and you know some of them there's a story to be tell the the fellow in the the second from the bottom left there if you look closely you're going to see him holding a raccoon um we have no idea but it looks to be there's got to be a story behind that and it makes you smile a little bit but uh uh you know, we don't know what that story is. That's Percy Devlin of Aaron, Arendelle. And uh, uh, again, those stories we don't have, but they, they do really start to tell. And some of these, these faces look so, so young. Um, and uh, again, lives cut short and uh, stories that ended in, in the First World War. Um, brothers as well, uh, the Whitehead brothers of Malton, all three brothers, uh, George, Robert and Arthur lost their lives during the conflict. The Thompson brothers of Port Credit, uh, Alexander, our highest ranking officer, a lieutenant colonel, and his brother, a, a, a lieutenant, uh, Douglas, uh, both, uh, both uh, uh, casualties of the war. And the Duncan brothers, three brothers served, two uh, lost their lives, George and Allen, and the middle brother was uh, lost, uh, lost, uh, lost eyesight in one eye and was severely injured at Vimy. Um, and so, you know, these stories of sacrifice really cement themselves within the narrative, but also within the community memory as well. 
Uh, in the Second World War, the same kind of story. Every one of these these uh, names is is uh, a life cut short, but a memory left behind uh, within the community. Uh, eighty six or sorry, eighty nine fallen, seventy nine names on local cenotaphs. Uh, many of them are yet to kind of be explored and, and learn more about, but we certainly have stories for almost every one of these individuals. Uh, things that have come out, uh, leading coder Selwyn Adamson of Streetsville, uh, one of our few merchant marine men to be lost during the Battle of the Atlantic when his ship, the HMCS St. Croix, was uh, was uh, uh, sunk by a German U-boat attack, and and someone lost his life. Um, but the stories go on. There, there are stories for every every one of these individuals, and uh, we've actually had some uh, some good fortune of, of making contact with some family descendants of uh, of a few individuals as well, um, and really helps to tell their story. And uh, uh, again, the, the 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 attrition rate is is quite uh, quite significant. One of our sadder stories is right at the end there on the right, you have uh, Private Winifred Lillian Brewster and her husband Edward John Brewster of Port Credit, both serving overseas. Shortly after they were married, they took a leave. Uh, they were going to, uh, some say it's a honeymoon, although it doesn't, uh, not uh, totally confirmed, but they were together in a Jeep um, and uh, they uh, they met with an accident. They, they missed a, a bridge abutment in, uh, and uh, were killed in the accident. And so their names appear as a, as a young married couple having ser serving overseas um, uh, on the Port Credit Cenotaph. And 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 they the, the stories go on and on. We have Indigenous soldiers during the, the Second World War. Uh, Arthur Beaver is one of them, uh, who was living in Clarkson at the time. Although he is a Mississauga, an Indigenous Mississauga, and, and uh, so his name appears uh, on uh, on the Port Credit Cenotaph as well. But at the time of the service, was living in and working in Clarkson. And the pictures again start to tell it all. Again, uh, I'm so struck by just the youth uh, in in many of these uh, these images. And uh, uh, these are faces of, of people who walked this land, who lived on these these streets, and and even more so than the first world war and the second world war, we can identify where some of them live because they have specific road addresses attached to them, and some of their houses are still here. And so that's part of the the, uh, the community memory as well. And so all of that is, leads us into. To, uh, um, discovering that narrative or uncovering those stories of individuals of, of context of their time and service um, and uh, you know then we start to explore how do we tell those stories and how do we share those stories and connect them to an audience people wrote down and recorded those names and, and you know it's on us to ensure that those who came before us and who fell in service their names are not forgotten and their stories are not forgotten and uh, and you know there's a number of ways of doing that but we were approached a number of years ago uh, 2012 I believe uh, uh, to that, that there might be an idea uh, to create a, uh, a, a visual depiction in a comic book format um, and it's not only military theme we've done other themes as well but uh, that, that this this might be an interesting way to convey stories and to tell stories and that put us in touch with uh, with Daniel and uh, and and his team as an idea and um, I, I will be honest I, I did not understand the format of, of, of comics or, or, or what it might entail or how we put things together or even what the success or the interest might be in doing so and so I've been blown away by the process of, of, of creation uh, and of, of creating um, narratives and stories, uh, if you will, and then uh, seeing them brought to life through Daniel's incredible talent. Um, and so we'll, uh, we will explore some of these, uh, these themes and these stories of, of how we create and take you know, factual information, factual research, and, and, and put it into a format that makes it accessible to an incredibly wide range of people. One of the, the true success stories around the comic uh, series, and it's an ongoing series, we're, we're working on, uh, we have nine produced volumes, we're working on 10 and 11 is in the works, and, and so this will, this will go on. Uh, I've always said to Daniel, and uh, with a little bit of humor, but I mean it earnestly, cannot do this without him, and uh, uh, wouldn't want to either, and, and it's it's been a, an incredible incredible uh, partnership in terms of just creating and crafting uh, crafting stories but um, it, it, it just it, people get a history education without knowing they've had one uh, and I think that's perhaps the, the the most fascinating part of this process as well is how we connect uh, history through a, a different medium 
uh, than, we, than we typically do and, and kind of how that resonates with people. So with that, I will end my part of the presentation and uh, we will turn that over to Daniel. Uh, so please welcome here uh, Daniel Wong um, and uh, Daniel um, from uh, from from me to you, I pass the I pass the baton, if you will, and uh, uh, just you can introduce uh, our our uh, how, how we do what we do. <laughs> so I think where I'm going to start is uh, I'm going to just pick up on where uh, kind of Ma where Matthew left off. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you one of our one of the comics that we did in the past. I think it was. 2015 when we did the legend of the ridge uh it's about bimmy ridge um give me a second here there we go. can you see everybody yes okay so so uh what we've got here uh well what we've tried to do with the comics is um instead of just telling a historical story, we try to incorporate, um, uh, I guess, students, uh, students that uh, young people that these comics are going to can identify with. And we typically have framed, uh, I think ever since from the first comic of the Avro Arrow, we framed it in the context of the students uh, being assigned a history uh, topic and they really don't know where to go uh, and, and what information that they can find. Uh, and, and oftentimes in the comic, we'll, they will express how, how boring history can be. And so we've created this uh, scenario where these students uh, just magically happen to meet up with our, our magical bus driver. And she takes them on a journey into the past. And um, through their eyes, we see uh, um, how the history may have unfolded. We we tend to mix a lot of fiction with uh, some historical truth. Uh, we base our, the places and the people on uh, information that Matthew finds on uh, our Mississauga residents. So I'll just uh, flip through these pages and give you an idea of what happens in this particular story. They've gone to go research at the library, and then the bus driver happens to show up in the in the elevator. And <laughs> when they drop down the elevator, they they end up in the tunnels of Vimy Ridge. And through this, uh, they're they're put through different tasks and and so forth. They meet uh, characters that are based on uh, people that we know uh, went to war. And they see things uh, like carvings in the Vimy Ridge tunnels. Uh, in this case, uh, I, I believe, Matthew, you mentioned the Duncan brothers. Yeah. Uh, in this particular comic, uh, we've highlighted um, their father, their, their father, Reverend yeah. uh, George. Is it yeah. George Duncan? Yeah. George Peter Duncan. Yeah. yeah. And so he tells the, the students a backstory about himself and and a little bit about his his children that are also fighting in the war. And then at the end, uh, you know, the, the magical bus driver brings them back and we usually tie it into a, a, a present day location with a present day um, context. So in this case, uh, they're brought back to St. Peter's Church where they see a plaque with with the names of um, the fallen soldiers, yeah. and they and they also uh, yep. they usually connect to within the story. They'll connect to an individual, and then that individual story is also highlighted within the remembrance aspect. Um, so, so like, like I said, the Duncans, but others as well that we've done in the past. So, the uh, and we should uh, the one constant character, and we smile when we say it is always unnamed. But that is the bus driver, as we've come to know her, and and you'll recognize uh, the bus driver throughout all the comics. Of course, it's uh, 
taking its likeness from Mayor Hazel McCallion, uh, former Mayor Hazel McCallion, and uh, we did get her permission <laughs> to do that. So she does appear in uh, in in all the comics are one constant, but unnamed. Uh, it is simply the bus driver. Right. Um, but uh, in the story is in the inside back cover of every issue. We present uh, kind of a student report, which is the the actual history that's explored within the narrative of the comic itself. Right. So, uh, so uh, I guess we should transition into uh, how we take uh, stories that Matthew uh, dig up, I guess you could say, on on certain characters and turn it into a comic book. I mean, it's it's a kind of an involved process. Typically, what happens is Matthew will come to me with a, a story idea with a, a set number of characters. Um, we then break down each of those, uh, uh, I guess, the narrative. And sometimes it comes with dialogue that is relevant to uh, the history we're trying to present. Um, and then we break that down into a script of pages or beats, uh, as you would call it. And then uh, it goes into a process of, like, for example, on this page, this is uh, page 23 from the Vimy Ridge comic. And what tends to happen is we will... Let's see here. Uh, so, so the script... From the script, what happens is I will imagine what needs to go on the page. Uh, uh, basically, a, a, a visual dialogue, as well as uh, and at the same time, we introduce um, uh, the actual dialogue or captions and so forth to tell the story. And then from that point, uh, we I would once we've kind of ironed out the story, we, uh, I would go in and, and uh, tidy up these lines and uh, create uh, cleaned up artwork. And then after that process, of course, we introduce colors and so forth. And that's how we uh, arrive at um, uh, a completed page. Uh, one of the ones that the, the last story we worked on, um, let me... Are you thinking of the Lancaster? Yep. Yeah. Uh, give me a second. I don't want to load. <laughs> so what I'm showing you here is actually the program in which uh, I used to create the comics. This is a, a double page spread of, uh, of our last comic uh, about the Lancaster. And um, let me see here. Just, just as you're, you're waiting yep. for it to load, Daniel, just one yep. thing I wanted to talk about is just kind mm -hmm. of the evolution of the story. And, and, sure. and, and we've, yep. done so, we've done nine of these things now, and I don't know if you, you know, we're, we're basically ten, although ten's not finished yet. But um, the, the sometimes the story comes easily, and sometimes you start out at one kind of one idea that and it evolves true. into yep. a different one just as you begin to put it together. And so the Lancaster is actually an excellent example of it because – the original focus point of the comic idea is something that was condensed to one page within the comic. So we were we were starting off with an idea of looking at Fairy Command and this idea of taking aircraft overseas uh, and, and the pilots involved therein. And it ended up being focused more on the production of the aircraft and the Fairy Command aspect uh, condensed from being the focal point to being just one, one small part of the larger comic. And that's just all just evolution of, of story and evolution of ideas and Daniel and I throwing things back and forth as to what fits. I mean, Daniel, you've got a, such an incredible concept of how a story can be told. Um, and, and, and that helps shape the, the narrative we, we come up with. So, so we might have an idea, but, uh, you know, we're equal partners in, in creating the story that would come to be. Right. I'm, I'm glad you kind of touched on that because yeah, that, that's something I always forget. Um, <laughs> That yeah, we do a lot of back and forth because sometimes uh, the the ideas that are are brought there's sometimes too much information 
yeah. or too much story to be told. And um, to to grasp the or to condense or, and, and hold the reader's attention, we need to focus on a particular uh, set of characters and a particular narrative. And then, and then all the extra information becomes just uh, supporting characters or supporting information. So yeah, so the, that, I mean, with Lancaster, that's how we evolved into the production side or focused onto the production side and, and kept it kind of at home yeah. rather than abor abroad. Yeah. Yeah, so as you can see here, this is just to show um, how uh, these pages are generally laid out. Um, I mean, this is for this is uh, what I'm showing you is rather quite far along in in our process, because uh, a lot of um, things that are early get thrown out, uh, and I don't keep them. So, yeah. So just like before, what we see is uh, we'll I'll transition that into um, cleaned up lines. And then uh, things are, uh, and when we do the colors, typically we, uh, I, I do, um, these are what's called flats, basically. And, and then there's each, each element starts um, added and gets rendered. And then, of course, we and then uh, usually near that the end, we tweak our dialogue and um, and then we come end up with the final product. It's it's it's, it's I mean, it sounds simple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to describe it in a way uh, that's uh, going into detail. But yeah, those are the basically the steps. Yeah, I was going to say it's layered steps. And one of the things yeah. to, to also make uh, it's not just I mean, Daniel, I come up with a story idea usually, and then Daniel will, will, will craft it. But we, we do have a series of, of individuals, depending on what story that we're involved in, that will also lend their expertise and their thoughts on the development of a story and, and the right. consultation process. So for the Lancaster comic, I was in touch with a, a, a Lancaster bomber historian out of, out of uh, Nova Scotia, uh, Mark People, who uh, assisted with the, the kind of the, the ideas behind it. and. Mm -hmm. And kind of the historical accuracy of it um, for the Cedar Park one on on the Ross family and early Black history. We were able to consult with uh, Lisa Small and others about just kind of the the accuracy of the depictions that we were we were looking to make. And so there's always a consultation team involved in kind of the the, the creation of the story. Although Daniel and I will lead the charge and kind of executing it, but it's it's not not in isolation. It's something that we're we're very much we reach. For, we reach out to connect with those that can aid and be part of that uh, that creation right. process. And oftentimes, uh, because it is a visual element uh, or a visual medium, uh, I'll often uh, it's through the process. I'll be contacting Matthew and say, "Hey, how would we present this? Do you have any imagery?" Um, uh, it. it in terms of the Lancaster, um, I was it was I was very thankful that Matthew had a Lancaster book uh, full of full of images uh, and of the how would you call it like blueprint type? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Blueprint yeah. the aircraft. Yep. So then uh, you know I I could draw from that. Uh, otherwise, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to to come up with the images to to suit the story. Yeah. So, do we have time to do? I think uh, Lauren, if we're okay, we got about five minutes. We can do uh, a, a concept here and share a creation story. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. So, Daniel, do you want to introduce what we're what we're going to attempt to do here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this will work out. Uh, let's, let's give it a shot. For everyone who's watching, you're the guinea pigs for an idea here in terms of sharing a, a creation story idea. Yeah, so we're going to create a one page comic for you as a brief demonstration. 
So you want to tell them the concept of the story? Well, we thought, we thought you know, something uh, with a little bit of humor, but also touching on our stories of remembrance and war. And I, I made reference to a moment in time uh, early in my presentation about uh, uh, soldiers stopping at a train station in Clarkson um, in the spring of 1915, where they were treated to tea and, and strawberry tarts from the uh, local women's institute. And uh, there's a backstory to it in that the, uh, the, the stopping of the train uh, was mechanical in nature, and uh, but it was fabricated, and that was uh, the officers uh, that were in charge of these uh, young men who had enlisted in Hamilton and were on their way to uh, to the exhibition grounds in Toronto uh, decided that they were going to test the mettle of their men, and the, and Clarkson was a good place to do it. And in advance, they had uh, uh, arranged that uh, schoolboys uh, in the local local Clarkson area would be waiting for them. And um, uh, the the story is is that uh, after they had their their tea and their and their strawberry tarts, that the soldiers were mobilized to march down Clarkson Road along Lakeshore Road, and at which point the young lads from the community sprung up out of the ditches and pelted them with apples. Uh, and uh, the newspaper recounts that uh, after a moment's hesitation, the soldiers returned fire. Uh, that is, there was an apple fight on Lakeshore Road in Clarkson, uh, and then uh, after the uh, the soldiers were were tested under fire, if you will, they were marched back to the train, and on the train they got, and, and away they went. So it was just a way for kind of the the officers to uh, kind of see how they they reacted under stress, see what their discipline was like, and perhaps have a little bit of levity uh, levity uh, amongst amongst the troops as well. But uh, yes, indeed, in the spring of 1915, there was a, an apple fight with soldiers along uh, Lakeshore Road. And Clarkson, and so just that brief little narrative. I uh, thought it would be kind of a neat way to do kind of a, an encapsulated little storyboard here, uh, Daniel. I'm having trouble with my uh -oh. hardware. Yeah, give me a second. No worries. But there's stories like that that, that come up uh, in our in our research, and that 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 probably is one of the most humorous ones that we we've come up uh, very locally. But the, that idea that intersection between service and uh, and the home front, um, where you know a, a, a women's association, a women's institute locally, uh, really found it to be their their obligation to to aid these soldiers and to provide for them. How's your program? Yeah, I don't think I'm having trouble, so it's not going to go. <laughs> yeah, unless I restart the system. Okay. Well, within uh, this, that's unfortunate. Yeah, it's unfortunate. We only had a couple of minutes, so maybe we'll. Yeah. Uh, may, maybe we'll have to, Daniel. Here's here's an idea. Maybe we yep. could uh, <laughs> sketch something together afterwards and uh, get Lauren to send it out to any attendees that uh, that they can see this idea of, of kind of how a storyboard comes together. Uh, but uh, it just it, it is a fascinating process. You showed the steps that we go through and, and uh, how we start with a story and come up with an, an, uh, a visual medium for it, because in most cases, in many of these cases, we're starting from nothing. We're starting from these vague ideas that we, we know the story and we know the individuals, but we don't really have uh, a lot of evidence to create from or base our drawings on and so you know that's through additional research and image searches and, and things like that to come up with with what the the visual fabric would look like and daniel you do an amazing job bringing those stories to life you truly truly do oh, thanks <laughs> so i i guess uh lauren i think we're kind of wrapped up with the formal part and so we can do uh certainly do some q a yeah, that would be great. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can feel free to place them in the chat or you can just raise your hand and we can unmute you. It was a good idea, Daniel. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I think, yeah. <laughs> it happens. It happens, yeah. Well, as we're waiting for some questions, I don't know if we have any questions yet, Lauren, but you know, one of the, the I, I alluded to earlier was just the difficulty of getting my brain around this. Like when it first came to me, uh, you know, it, somebody was from, uh, her name was Paula Paletto from the Culture Division City saying, I think there's a neat marriage here. And she had greater foresight and or, or wisdom than I did in it. And uh, I will admit, I, I came into the process probably dragging my feet a little bit. Um, but uh, it's just, it's been an incredible 
one of my favorite things to get involved with every year is, is this. And we started off originally, Daniel, we were just doing one a year, I think, for the first several years. And now I yes. think three years in a row now, we've done two a year, right? It's that's yeah, I, I we, think we, so. we yeah, yeah. The number 10 should be out just around mid December, December yeah. Awesome. I don't see any questions uh, coming in yet. I'll get us started. Um, Daniel, I know when we chatted, you had mentioned yep. you work on different types of art. Um, I'm curious yes. if you have a favorite that you work on. Is working on comics something you lean towards? Yeah, I, I, uh, well, in general, I'm a freelance artist, uh, so I do various number of number of things. Uh, but in general, I like the creative process of uh, producing comics because it's not just um, drawing one thing. Each time is different because you're dealing with a story, how to bring that story into a visual, uh, like to show it visually. Um, and it's not as simple as creating a single image. The Each page, all the panels need to tie together. It's got to draw the eye. Uh, it has to keep the viewer or the reader's attention uh, to a certain degree. So there's a there's a lot of um, aspects to the creative process that I enjoy. Awesome, thank you. And we have a couple of questions coming in now. Um, Kyle's asking if you are going to offer a collected edition of the comics. Oh, that's oh, interesting, yeah. <laughs> like a trade paperback <laughs> is what they would call it in the comic book industry. No, we we'll, we'll ha we haven't thought of that yet, but yeah. I don't, at least I haven't. We should we should maybe. But when do you do that? At some point, right? Because uh, right. you know we have no 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 plans to to end it. Maybe, maybe you do it in tens or something after we do uh, volume ten <laughs> comes out. We do the first ten or something. <laughs> there you go. Good idea. Good idea. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Sure. Um, and then Joan is asking. Uh, she says, "Thanks. That was interesting. With all the backgrounds that you've researched, is there somewhere to see it all together?" There will be. Um, are you talking in terms of the profiles of fallen soldiers and the like? Is that, is that what she's... I'm, I'm assuming that's where we're... I know we're not back and forth here. Um, yeah. So there will be. Uh, Heritage Mississauga is long delayed in, in getting our new website launched. Um, and I don't have a particular time frame on that, although it is in development now. Um, I suppose it's something we can share with uh, across our partner networks and whatnot when it, when it does launch, because we'll be linking to, to PAM activities and the like. Um, but they will live on our website, uh, the new website, eventually. Um, and I would say within probably a you know three to six month window, they'll be up up there. Um, so of the uh, math is not my strong point, but uh, 96 from the First World War, 89 from the Second World War, uh, we were probably in the neighborhood of about three quarters of them have bios and pictures now. Um, and so those are the ones that we'll be uh, we'll be we'll be sharing and we'll expand that as as research continues. But I, I should mention as well, we focus this presentation today on the First and Second World War. We have also delved into uh, the Northwest Rebellions, uh, the Fenian Raids, and the War of 1812 and the Rebellion of 1837, uh, as well as for other remembrance projects. Um, we haven't touched yet the South African War or the Second Boer War, um, and we really haven't delved into more recent uh, conflicts and peacekeeping initiatives as well. Uh, 2009, we know we had a fallen soldier from Afghanistan uh, from Mississauga as well. So, so the idea is to create kind of a, a, a virtual war memorial of all the conflicts that we have, um, and then as we develop biographies and you know, uh, portraits of people who can find them in places of, 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 of burial when known, then those are stuff that we'll share on one site so people can access it. And, and that will be coming and it's it's uh, it's in development now. Awesome. And then um, we're being asked uh, where we can get the comics. So I can plop the link in for the digital comics, but if anyone wants a hard copy, is there? Uh, we have about 
uh, a few thousand copies at our office at the Grange, you're more than welcome to contact us directly if you want to pick them up. But if you want to actually go where the comics are available right now in the public, because the Grange, our office at the Grange is not yet open to the public with the, the ongoing pandemic, although we are slowly migrating ourselves back there. Um, the the Hazel McCallion uh, 100 Years of Memories, which is a, an exhibit on the life and times of Hazel McCallion, is at the Air Mills Town Centre right now and it runs until the end of February um, and all the comics are available for pickup uh, at that location as well and they are going I'm I'm at that facility uh, at least once or twice a week refilling the comic shelves um, so we have all nine issues uh, there uh, for, for pickup and they're all free they're free whether you come to the office or they're free uh, uh, thanks to our sponsors who make that possible whether it be Community Foundation the City of Mississauga who's ever involved there's, there's so many partners involved over time um, that help allow us to print it and make them available so they are they are certainly uh, available so so contact us Lauren you feel free to share our contact information but uh, um, they're no good sitting in boxes <laughs> let's get them out there <laughs> awesome and then Chrissy is asking are you willing to share what themes will be covered in upcoming comics sure um uh, Daniel, do you want me to do it or? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, right now. Sure, yeah. But okay. right, so, uh, issue 10 is uh, about uh, stone hookers. Yes. Stone hookers are sailing vessels out of Port Credit. And we're fo our comic is going to focus on a particular naval disaster, I think would be the best term, that, that took place off the shores of Port Credit. Um, and then number 11, which is, uh, fingers crossed, due out in February, is going to focus on a remarkable new story, a uh, newly uncovered story, of an early black family who settled in historic Mississauga briefly in the 1850s, um, and uh, uh, we'll be exploring their story in, uh, in volume 11. Um, volume 12? I haven't thought that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> we have wow. ideas, but we haven't got there yet. Yeah. Perfect. So I think those are all our questions. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Daniel and Matthew, for taking the time to share with us today. It was so great to hear these stories and learn more about the comic creation process. So just so everyone knows, PAMA is currently closed to the public for a large renovation project, but we look forward to welcoming our visitors back next year. In the meantime, we have shifted gears to online and actively share content, videos, activities, and programming designed for all ages. For anyone out there with kids, we do have a variety of programming coming in December for a winter break, so definitely take a look out for that. So thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to connecting again soon. Thank and you for hosting. There's something coming in that says, thank you so much for showing us something new about Mississauga. Comics are great. Fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Daniel. Your talent is, is incredible. And thank you, Lauren, for hosting us. And uh, always fun. Sure.